Welcome to the Homegrown Podcast, the place where we share the truth about food and farming from our kitchen to yours. I'm your host, Liz Hazelmeyer, along with my husband, Joey. Good afternoon. And together, we hope to educate, inspire, and equip you in your pursuit of true nourishment. Today's guest is Hannah Frankman. Hannah is the founder of Rebel Educator and the host of the fast-growing Hannah Frankman Podcast. She has almost a decade of experience in the alternative education world, working with organizations ranging from apprenticeship programs to fellowships to Montessori schools. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about exactly those things. Schooling outside of the norm. I want to talk about institutionalized schooling. I want to talk about homeschooling. I want to cover all those topics. So Hannah, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been really looking forward to this. I'm so excited. I love sitting down with a fellow podcaster. I've seen several clips of your podcast and that's what caught my eye. Just they like were throwing up on my reels. I was like, ooh, she's got some really interesting both guests on her show and also little tidbits of your philosophy. So I want to dig into that today. Um, but before we get there, can you tell our audience a little bit more about you and your background and how you even got interested in education? Yeah, I'm a product of everything that I'm going to spend this interview talking about. So I grew up homeschooled. I went to a Montessori inspired preschool and kindergarten mm. and then first grade all the way through 12th grade I was homeschooled by my parents so I grew up completely outside of the status quo system and I really didn't realize I think for a lot of my childhood how unusual that was my sense of it being unusual was very sort of circumstantial like I remember going to the grocery store and having the cashier asked, oh, why aren't you in school today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was like, what are you talking about? This is school. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember like spending time with my grandparents and them explaining to their friends, oh, she's homeschooled and explaining what that meant because most people in their world weren't familiar with homeschooling at all. It's I feel like the landscape's changed quite a bit since I was being homeschooled in the early 2000s to mm -hmm. what it looks like today almost, I mean, what, 20 years later, it's very different. Um, so I was aware in these like fleeting moments, I'd see the school buses and I knew that that's what normal kids did, but I really didn't understand what a deviation from the norm, the entirety of the experience I was having was really until after I'd graduated and I started going out into the working world and started comparing the way that I interacted with the world with the way that most people did. And I started to realize just how different that foundation had been. Mm -hmm. So I was, I started working full time when I was in, still in high school. I worked on a vegetable farm and orchard, oh, uh, which fun. was, I, in, I'm, I'm very biased, but I think that's the coolest first job you could ever possibly have. It was mm -hmm. so great. Um, but I and while I was, you know, working full time and having a very self-directed homeschooling experience as a high schooler, um, I decided not to go to college, which I was a really, really academic kid and I loved school and I'd always assumed I was going to be college bound, but I just kind of realized over time that so much of the experience that I was having in high school was probably more tailored and more customized to the things that I wanted to be learning than the first couple years of college ever possibly could be. Mm -hmm. And I had enough financial savvy to realize that I didn't want to spend tons of money for a degree that I really didn't need when I was totally. thinking about careers I might want to have. Mm -hmm. So I ended up skipping college to go work for a startup apprenticeship program where I was helping other young people skip college and go break into the business world, I kind of took this like meta track where I'm like, I'm going to work for the company that's teaching everybody how to do this. And like, hopefully along the way, I'll learn a lot about this too. And that's really when I started to realize, wait a second, being homeschooled was like my entire worldview is just so different from the worldview of a lot of the people that I'm talking to in ways that I really didn't conceptualize prior to that moment. Mm -hmm. Um so I started working in the education world and started talking about what I was doing and talking about my story. And just more and more, I started to realize that this was a thing that I really cared about. And because I had had, I'd lived the experience, I could talk about it in ways that weren't just theoretical. And mm -hmm. I could talk about it in ways that were very personal and very pointed. And I could draw from both my experience as a student, but also my experience growing up in a family that was successfully doing this thing. Um, 
So I started talking about this more and more and realized pretty quickly, I don't think there's any work I could be doing that feels more important than this. Mm -hmm. So this is now like a thing that I spend a lot of time doing at any point in time for like, I wonder what Hannah's up to. There's a very good chance that I'm either podcasting with somebody or like lounging around under the sun, writing tweets about why the education system is broken and how you should homeschool your kids. <laughs> so that's, that. that's the story. That's how we got here. I love that. Were you, did you have siblings in your home? I did. I had one younger sister. Okay. And so she was homeschooled too, I assume. She was. Cool. And were you guys a part of a co-op or a like once a week program or were you like solely at home? How did that work out? Yeah, it varied a little bit over the years. When we were first getting started, we were part of I think a couple co-ops in the first mm. maybe couple years. And then we found one that we really liked and we were part of that for it was a once a week thing. It was like a full day, mm -hmm. one week, one day out of the week. Um for like a spring semester and a fall semester. Mm -hmm. And we did that, I think, all the way up till middle school. Um, and so that was – it was such a cool – it was actually a really cool co-op. There was – the mornings, they they rented out a building at the county park and hired all the naturalists. And we did all of these like science and like nature classes. It was so cool. We learned about – everything from sh how to build shelters and how to identify wild animals and how to wow. and wild edibles and how to track things and how to like go down into the creek and take samples and figure out what's going on in the creek and then we do animal dissections and all kinds of crazy stuff um and then in the afternoons it was kind of your standard like the whole group mm. hires a drama teacher and a spanish teacher and the kids learn together things that the parents maybe don't have as much expertise teaching mm -hmm. um when i was in middle school there was some like internal schisms with the co-op that we were a part of and it like split into different pieces. And so then I kind of bounced around between a couple of different like smaller subsets of the original group. And then in high school, I was much more focused on like things that I was interested in. So, like I sang in choirs and I was part of book clubs and things like that. I was sort of picking and choosing activities that were tailored more towards my interests or mm -hmm. starting my own things at that point. Um, so it was kind of a an eclectic mix. I, I feel like the landscape's a little different now than it was then. There's just more options. So I think it's easier to find everything from hybrid schools where you're there two or three days a week to, you know, different types of co-ops that fit different needs. I feel like there were just fewer choices, but I feel like we always struck a pretty good balance, honestly. Mm-hmm. Mm so as a fellow homeschooler, I have to ask, what did yes. your day look like? So, so <laughs> there, so many people think, and we'll get, I want to get into this, that, that homeschooling means you just sit at home all day and you miss all the opportunities that kids would have. And, and a big one that I love to dispute, and we'll get to this, I'm sure, but is like school dances. That used to be a thing that people would <laughs> ask me is like, Are you gonna go to but you don't get any school dances. I'm like, Newsflash, I don't want to go to a school dance. Bad things happen at public Anyhow, school dances. Regardless. Parents just letting you know. <laughs> only bad and, things happen. And for the parents that are out there like, no, school dances are the best. You could totally find a way to do dances just, just to throw that out there. Like yeah. co-ops do dances. It's a thing. So, I mean, if you're a diehard dance person. Uh, anyways, but there are days at home, right? So so uh, while we are still getting out, we still have opportunities. And believe it or not, there's two, you know, socially functioning humans on a call right now that were both <laughs> homeschooled for, you know, over 90% of their schooling career. Um, what did the day look like for you, like actual homeschool day? Yeah, it was, you know, dystopian. Like we got up in the morning and we never took off our pajamas and we never talked to another soul for weeks at a time. Like, I don't know how I'm sitting here talking to you. No, I'm totally kidding. Um, um, it was great. I had such an idyllic childhood, like truly. I don't think I realized how amazing it was until I was well in my adulthood. And then I started looking back and I was like, wow, it was like those Instagram reels that people mm. obsess over where there's, you know, a kid running barefoot outside carrying a chicken and like running to go climb a tree and, you know, swinging off of some rope swing that their dad made in the front yard. And they're like picking flowers in the garden. And that was, that was actually basically it. Um, I mean, honestly, there was a lot of variation in what a day looked like because it was a very organic experience. So sometimes I would get up in the morning and go play outside and I'd be outside all day, especially in the summer, uh, I would go long stretches of time without ever wearing shoes and just playing outside. And it was wonderful. 
um, I don't know, sometimes I get up in the morning and mom would be making bread and, you know, there'd be like, we'd be in the kitchen doing things. And sometimes we'd be doing more focused schoolwork at the start of the day. And other times, you know, we'd get up in the morning and we'd go to co-op because it was a Wednesday and that's when we'd go to co-op and meet with our friends and, I don't know, dissect an opossum or something weird, like whatever we were doing that day. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was a lot of variation. I think one of the things that's really important to understand about homeschooling and anyone who's listening to this, who knows, who is a homeschooler or knows homeschoolers knows that this is true, but it needs to be said for people who aren't familiar with homeschooling. Homeschooling is wildly different from just keeping your kids at home all day, but replicating the school experience, like Mm -hmm. the school part of school, the, the word school kind of needs to be separated out. Like it can be a place but it can also be a set of actions and there's like a set of actions that happen in the place, but like you can leave the place, but think that you still have to be completing the set of actions in order to be like getting a school experience. Um, And excuse me, being educated does not require the actions that are requiring in the brick and mortar school. Mm -hmm. And so most homeschooling families, like even if they try to replicate what happens inside of the school at the beginning, very quickly, They start to realize that most of the time is dead time and most of the time is completely wasted. And so we we would do school probably most days, Mm. but it was like a couple hours of time and it was wildly varied. So sometimes I would be reading something that my mom had assigned to me. Sometimes we would be going for a walk down the road and looking at the mushroom bloom that was happening because it had just rained. And then we'd, you know, draw the different mushrooms and then go home and read about all the weird ways that mushrooms grow under the ground that you can't see, but that's wildly fascinating. Um, Sometimes school would mean sitting down and doing math worksheets, but sometimes it would also just be me sitting around with a novel reading all day because Mm. I loved to read and it was raining outside. And, Mm. you know, that counts as school too. If your kid is internalizing language and grammar and sentence structure Mm -hmm. by just absorbing a book that they're fascinated by. So there was tons of variation. When I got older, it was a little bit different because like I said, I was more academic and I thought for a long time that I was on the college track. So I was pretty deliberate about making sure that I was doing the things that I would need to do Mm -hmm. to have a good transcript if I decided to go to a high level school. Uh, I also just really loved the practice of getting up in the morning and doing really academic things. I was such a nerd. Um, (laughs) So I would like in high school, I had a much more structured day where I'd get up in the morning and I'd like go down to my desk and I'd write out what I wanted to do for the day. And then I would watch video lectures and read books and, you know, write essays because those were the primary activities that made up what I was doing in high school. But, you know, it was it was a very organic experience, which is, you know, I think what education should be. And I think a lot of people kind of miss that when they're thinking about homeschooling at the in the in the beginning, they think that it's going to have to be a very complicated endeavor and they're going to have to have all of this structure in place before they ever pull their kids out of school to make sure that they can deliver all the things that they need. And they kind of forget that kids are hardwired to not sit still and they're hardwired to do things. And most of the things that they are interested in doing are useful. So if you just kind of like let your kid go explore the world around them and you give them very constructive prompts to do types of things that are going to be useful for their development you really don't have to structure it much more than that honestly and the kid will probably thrive Mm. more quite honestly if you don't Mm -hmm. i love that explanation and i I totally agree right and so i had a very similar experience and so so for people that don't know i was homeschooled um from the a so i went to uh preschool i went to school for preschool and i was homeschooled until my sixth grade year And in sixth grade, I went to a private school for one year, and then I was homeschooled until 11th grade, and I went to a career center in 11th and 12th. And so that was all the other years I was I was homeschooled, and very similar experience. This I like how you call it like an organic thing, and that's kind of how we homeschool at our house as well. And I think that that's a major deterrent for a lot of people, and that's the reason why I asked is that rarely do you ask somebody what was school like for you. Like, well, we are up at eight, and we were at our desks. 
And then mom came into the room and she was wearing that same sweater again. You know? I can think of one friend. She took attendance. Have. And she, she took made attendance. Sure we were all there. Okay. I can think of one friend that we have I that know, did this I week know. and no one else. You know, and it's, everyone has, I mean, it's very uncommon that that happens. And, you know, we, we, there was no, like, we went to the chalkboard and I, you know, and then we had our lesson and then we sat down and, you know, mom had a lesson plan and we had to st stick with it. We couldn't miss a lesson. It, it was not that way. It was very much uh, a very fluid experience wherein, uh, wow, Joey was exceptional at math, so he exceeded my, you know, mom's ability to teach him very quickly. Therefore, we hired a tutor so that Joey could continue to excel in something that he was good at, rather than, yeah. well, we just won't, won't worry about it anymore, right? So, uh, anyhow, uh, I wanted to make a comment because as you were talking and just all the different things you experience as a homeschooler, that I feel like, as like in your childhood, there, and, and, and again to each their own everybody makes their own decisions for their life and you have everyone has different circumstances and so but i'm saying for me i think there was so much opportunity for me to ex explore and mature and, and and become who i am today because of homeschooling and the one way i'm going to explain this and it's kind of funny is i have always been that friend or in the friend group or the the guy people know or the kid and whatever that was annoyingly good at everything and everyone always say like, why is Joey always good? It's like, hey, you guys want to play ping pong? And it's like, Joey's like, well, I'm good. At, you know, I will tell them I'm good at ping pong or like, you know, hey, does anybody want to go like, you know, play this sport or, uh, you know, cook in the kitchen or uh, X, Y, Z. There's very few things that hobbies, if you will, that we will get into where I haven't done that thing. And there's a reason. There's a reason why growing up, I did it all. It's because, well, I had. I didn't have anything binding me to school. So I could go to the ski slopes and learn how to snowboard and ski. And I could do all those things because I wasn't going to school. And and it was something that was part of my childhood, as a part of my development. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather and I, when, before he got old and couldn't like hang out with me anymore, him and I got to hang out together and his passion was ping pong. And so you know what we did? We went to his house. He had a ping pong table there. And he would he was so excited to watch me and my brothers play and he wanted to teach us. And it was just like this thing, right? So I, I got to have that experience, right? My dad uh, was in business and leadership and he wanted me to go to him, his office with him to learn what he does and how he meets people and how he you know, conducts interviews and meetings. And I was 11 years old, sitting in staff meetings, bored out of my mind, mind you, right? It's not like no kid is growing up thinking like, wow, this is gonna be really good for my development. Right. So I'm glad I'm going to work with dad. <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? So anyways, I, I, I just want to, Put that out into the into the kind of like atmosphere, just just into this episode, and say that I was that annoying person, kind of through college and and, and after that. Whenever it was anything, hey, well, isn't it annoying that Joey's good at everything? Well, it's not because I'm just this gifted person. It's because well, you know, I probably spent more time playing ping pong than you did. Yeah, I, I probably went to you know the ski slopes more than you did. I probably was you know I was out with my mom and dad in the garden every year yeah i was probably running a lawnmower i was probably fixing that thing with dad because yeah exactly like, like hannah said i'd wake up in the morning and you know academics were you know all right let's see let's, how's joy does his worksheets well guess what it wasn't like we had to wait for the whole class to be done it was like okay did you finish your math worksheets yeah all right well we've got a we've got this lesson plans for the year and he just did three days worth so let's just like hold off on math today and uh i don't know let's go start a garden and then we'll start a little farmer's market of our own and it's just stuff happens you'll you're looking at mushrooms i mean it's just it's it's outstanding right you probably talk to people like how do you know all this about mushrooms it's like it's not because you went to you know some university and where you have formal education around mushrooms you just had time to talk about it i don't know so i'm going on a rant here but no, that I like is I, I i think the the average day of homeschooling is a major deterrent for people that want to homeschool because they're anxious, they're, mm -hmm. they're they're fearful of, you know, exactly what like Hannah said. It's, you know, we're not calling attendance. We're not, uh, anyhow. Well, yeah, yeah. First of all, Hannah, I'll leave you some space to react to anything Joey said, and then I'll ask my follow up question if you have something. Yeah, I, I do. I do have a couple of thoughts. I think the point that you just made is incredibly important, and I think I think there are a couple of layers to why it's important. I think that you're completely correct that when you're not spending seven hours a day sitting around waiting for other people mm -hmm. which is most of what kids do in school and it's in a, it's a you know the, the time constraints are dramatically uh exaggerated 
partially because it serves a child care function. So like, well, it has to last the say it has to last the duration of a work day so that the parents have somewhere to send their kids while they're working. Mm, like true. there's there's no incentive for it to be more efficient. But you know, and, and kids are sitting around waiting for their classmates. It's like, okay, well, we roughly need this much time for every subject, even though no kid needs this much time for every subject. We kind of got to like, you know, set set to the mean in every subject and at every point in the day. And then you get this enormous amount of bloat and wasted space. But when you don't have that, kids have so much space to just be, which is what kids are designed to do. Children are hardwired to learn how to mm -hmm. interact with the adult world. It's how we survive. We have to be innately curious about these adult things like cooking dinner and, you know, why are kids like the kids are fascinated by the mom goes to the store and then they want to play store and they, you know, watch someone teach a class at school and then they want to play school and they want to role play all of these things because they're trying to grapple with it, figure out like, how do I actually do this in order to be an active participant in the world and not just be, you know, this sort of passive person in my car seat in the back of the car, just sort of being like trundled around, hoping that someone remembers to feed me every time I'm hungry. Like, you know, they, they want to be able to do this for themselves. They want to be a self-sustaining organism. Um, but, you know, they're, they're wired to do that through play and through doing things and you know some of it's very practical like they're fascinated by mom making dinner and they want to you know copy like playing chopping up their vegetables and you know whatever but sometimes it's much more you know grandpa loves ping pong so they're going to learn ping pong too because it sounds really fun but also grandpa does it so that makes it extra mm -hmm. fun mm -hmm. and so you get these positive feedback loops and i find it really interesting i I mean, I spent a lot of time on the internet talking about homeschooling and, and alternative modalities of education in general, not just homeschooling, but, you know, different types of alternative schools and, and methodologies as well. But I have a lot of conversations with people, <laughs> excuse me, a lot of conversations with people who are really interested in homeschooling or they've met homeschoolers. And I just hear this refrain again and again oh, we love homeschoolers. Homeschoolers are so impressive. Homeschoolers are so much better at talking to adults than other kids. I was like, no kidding. They actually get to talk to adults during the day instead of being in a classroom. Like yeah. they have to raise their hand to ask that's for funny. permission to speak to an adult. Like that's not going to teach them good social skills. No kidding. Um, but you have kids who are in, like they're out in the world doing real world things. So of course they're going to be super impressive and it's not that we just choose all the superstar kids to homeschool it's mm -hmm. that they're allowed to tap into a part of their nature mm -hmm. that they otherwise just don't have space for if they're stuck inside a classroom all day and i think that's a really important distinction that your kid can be that if they're given the space to mm. and it's just that we live in a world that you know has has domesticated and caged our children so thoroughly that they have no space for their wings to grow at all in any regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that was evident when both of you all were just talking is like you both spent a lot of time around adults and we stress so much. How are our kids going to turn out as adults? What's the marker of a successful parent there? They have adults that are high functioning. And it's like we, if you think about it, it's very opposite to say, hey, we're going to isolate students to only be around their peers for 12 years and their most formative years and then hope that they figure out how to be an adult. And they're going to have some adults in there, but it's going to be like a one to 30 ratio, right? And it's it's just going to be skewed. And so I know my experience in the public school, my parents were very much like, you know, they were like, we want to be a part of the school. They were pretty involved. Like my dad would come into my fourth grade math class and like once a week be the child helper or the parent helper. But like, I still grew up not knowing who the heck I was and had severe like identity confusion. And that was one of the main reasons why we decided to homeschool our girls is because like we want our kids to know who they are and to know who they are. They have to know who this family is and they need their family identity instilled in them before they go out into a group setting where they have to then express to other people who they are. And I just can't ask that of a first grader or a, or a kindergartner or a preschooler. I don't even know the function of preschool and kindergarten, to be honest. And we pretty much skip 
first grade in general. Like we kind of wait until our stu- our kids are like seven ish years old, and at that point, um, I guess that is first grade. But like to me, even grade levels are confusing because you're breaking them up into such small portions of their peer groups, like literally within 12 months of an age. Mm -hmm. And I just think you are both having exposure to adults who were positive influences in your life is so formative and it makes total sense. And I feel like that, that would have really been helpful for me in my schooling and upbringing. I think I would ask, ask the question for a lot of people. And I think this is a good practice for yourself if you're considering it. It's like, when have you, like thinking back, right? I went to college. And Elizabeth went to college twice. I actually went to college twice. And I'm like, when did you learn the most in your life? Your whole life, not just your schooling time. Because like, I think that's where we make a mistake is we think that education stops at the end of school. So if you don't go to college, well, that's the end of your your education. You can't learn anything else after college. And so if you you don't go to college, you're going to miss out. It's like, okay, Um, for me, Obviously, there's things that I've picked up and learned, but like, let's talk about education, things where I've like excelled and man, after college, when I've chosen to learn new things, reading books and like researching, running a podcast for two years, like the, I've learned so much more now than I ever learned in mm-hmm. college or in, in, in a classroom because our learning, our education never stops. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where people, they, they forget that. They forget mm-hmm. that once I've learned something, it's not like, that's it. And I'll, I'll totally be able to, uh, um, you know, pick up where we, where we left off and continue to move forward. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Hannah, I would love to hear the, from your perspective and just in your conversations you've had with people and your observation, break down some of the ways you feel the current public school setting is in direct contrast to an optimized childhood. And you can be as spicy as you want to be. I'm giving you the full stage. But I want to hear your opinion because I think this opinion is not expressed all the time. So I would love to hear it. Honestly, it would be a lot faster to just describe the ways that it is aligned with a child's ideal development because it's a much shorter list. (laughs) Go for that. (laughs) Go for it. Much shorter list. No, I think... There are so many ways that the way we structure education in the status quo system is directly at odds with what children most need to develop. It's an absolute laundry list. And when you think about it, because I, I think I think the context is important because like, you kind of have to separate out the motivation of the the building of the structure in the first place from the structure that we have because it can be hard at first to be skeptical or there could be sort of like some built-in um you know assumptions of benevolence about the system it's like well it was built by people who are experts in childhood development and they want the best for our kids so like it's it's rooted in something that's like good and important even if you know, it's not a great fit for every child. But the intent of the system was never to cater to the developmental needs of the individual. The individual was very low in the list of priorities of the system mm. as it is structured. So the education system as we know it has sort of, it's been about 150, 160 years that it's been in development, about 100 years of it being, you know, pretty much universal across america Mm -hmm. um like every every air every town or every region has its local district and like pretty much everybody like we have compulsory public education everybody Mm -hmm. goes unless they have some sort of you know they're intentionally exempting themselves from it to go to a private institution or to be homeschooled like it's this sort of universal thing that's a fairly new phenomenon in the history of humans Mm -hmm. but it also like the entire thing was designed to be a system and systems are inherently at odds with the individual needs of the individual pieces because you can't have every single person. It's like, well, I don't like reading. Like I read best after lunch. So I know that we're doing reading right now, but I would do better if I do my reading later. It's like, well, sorry, we're trying to move 
30 plus kids through this progression throughout the day. So we can't cater to that. And immediately you start to have this conflict between what an individual child might need or might that might most be in their benefit and what the system needs to enforce in order to be able to say sustain itself as a system. So the entire point of the system was to create, you know, sort of a homogenized educated populace where everybody sort of has this interchangeable education foundation where they have these like base the base knowledge that they need to interact in the workforce and to interact as citizens of the United States. And like that sort of, as long as those boxes are being checked, so like, okay, cool, we're, we're delivering a good education, um, which begs the co- question at what cost, which we'll, we'll come back to in a little bit. But because of this structure, there is so much that is at odds with what a child needs, both on an individual level where kids just really do learn at different times and in different ways. So when you have a structure that's forcing every child through this sort of approximated median set of Mm -hmm. approaches and expectations, it's like, well, most kids are ready for multiplication in third grade. So we're going to teach it to everybody, even though some kids were ready three years ago and some kids really aren't quite ready to grasp it. So they're going to go through the multiplication curriculum and they're not going to fully understand it and they're going to be frustrated by it. And then when they get to division the next year, they're going to be even more frustrated because they still don't understand this. And they're also going to have this deep seated sense that they're just not good at math. And they're probably never going to shake that. Mm -hmm. And they're probably going to like, you know, barely make it through algebra and geometry in high school and then never take a math class again, if they can help it. And they're going to go through life thinking that they're bad at math. And really they're not bad at math. They just were forced into it maybe a year too early. Mm -hmm. And they could have loved math for the rest of their lives if it had been taught a different way. Um, There are other symptoms, there are other expressions of this too, where because we're teaching to the mean, we're sort of like teaching to the average of the class, we have standards for, you know, how, what percentage of something you have to learn in order to be able to move on to the next thing, which, you know, we approximate through grades. So you get a C and you are able to move on to the next grade level. Um, like a 60 to 70% can be a passing grade, which when you think about it, really what that means is a child can go through an entire year of learning something and only understand 60 to 70% of the material and be considered ready for the next thing. But there's 30 to 40% of it that they don't understand and they never learned. And because most subjects build upon themselves, that means that you're like trying to build the next story of a building on a story that only has like, 60% of the scaffolding in place. And you're like, yeah, it's fine. Like it won't fall down. We can, we can build this structure and it's going to be okay. Um, But we have huge amounts of kids getting pushed through the system with huge holes in their knowledge where they are, you know, being, they're expected to, you know, do complex algebraic problems and they can't remember the order of operations because they like never fully internalized it or they like mm. can't remember how to do different aspects of long division or like they can't remember how to simplify fractions or multiply fractions or whatever, but they got 60 or 70% in fractions. So like technically they're considered ready, but they're not. So you have all of these sort of like systemic issues where because the whole thing is operating as a system, it's selling kids short or like you know, directly stunting their development because they're being forced to grow inside of a box that is not shaped for them at all. But then there are all kinds of other things that are, you know, those are some of the obvious ones where it's like, okay, you can look at there's like this direct cause and effect of the child's expected to learn this thing, but they're learning in this structure and that's preventing them from learning this thing. And like, you know, it's this sort of direct A to B sort of first degree symptom. But then there are all of these other sort of more subtle things that the structure of the way that the adults interact with the kids themselves is also causing. So children love taking ownership of things. They love feeling a sense of responsibility and they love feeling a sense of accomplishment. And a lot of their development is driven by their intrinsic desire to feel those things. 
So a child wants to get to do something by themselves, decide they're going to do it, do it, and then feel proud of themselves for having accomplished the thing. And in order to feel a sense of accomplishment, you have to have a sense of responsibility. Like you had to be the one who decided to do the thing and who did the thing. It can't be done for you. You can't have, can't have been babysit, babysat through the entire process. If you are, you don't feel like you accomplish something. Yeah. Um, and yet the entire nature of the system is this structure where you have, like you said earlier, Liz, you have this authority figure who is in charge. It's an adult. They're big. They're loud. They're scary compared to you. They're much more physically powerful. Like, of course, you're going to feel some level of deference towards that. And the child has to adhere to what the adult says. And so children are taught from a very early age to follow, but not to like lead themselves. And so like when you give a child space to do things for themselves, and the, the Montessorians are great at this. When, when done well, the Montessori approach like really embraces this piece of the philosophy in particular. Like a child is capable of doing all kinds of things in a self-directed manner and having a sense of ownership that like I chose to do this and I did it and I won. Mm -hmm. And that feels great. And I'm proud of myself for having accomplished this. And I have a great motivation to go e experience the next feeling of accomplishment. But I'm also developing this sense of self-esteem that I can, like, I can decide I'm going to do something and I can figure it out and I can do it and I can be solely responsible for being the one who made this thing happen in my life. And that level of like self-efficacy and your trust in your self-efficacy is so important for being a functional adult. And most kids never get the chance to do it except in an extraordinarily babysat and controlled setting all the way through until they're 18. And then we just sort of dump them out into the adult world. It's like, cool, congratulations. You passed all the tests. Now you get to go be an adult like us. Good job. And the kid's like, but I've never actually done any of these things. Like I just like read a bunch of things and like checked boxes on a multiple choice quiz. I don't actually know how to do anything. Um but the entire system is structured that way. There's also like, you know, to your point earlier, Liz, the the arbitrariness of the grade structure, like kids are being forced to interact with people who were born very arbitrarily within their birth year. Yeah. And it's weird, right? Like it's even the cutoff is super arbitrary. It's like you can have a kid in August, born, born in August, who's in one grade and a kid born in September that's in another grade. And yeah. that kid who's born the September after, like a month after the kid born in August is in a grade, the same grade as a kid born the next August, yeah. but not the kid that's actually like close to them in age. Mm -hmm. It's very weird when you think about it. Mm -hmm. And kids are missing out on so much. Like kids are like very naturally, like little kids want to emulate and admire older kids and older kids learn by teaching younger kids. But we strip kids of all of that and they're just sort of like cloistered away in their separate little enclaves and they're not allowed to talk to each other and they're like not learning how to function around anyone other than these direct very arbitrarily chosen peers um and kids like they're also separated out by sort of aptitude level so you have the really smart kids and then or like the academically gifted kids and then you have sort of the average kids and then you have the kids that need some extra remedial help and you might give them all fancy names so that the kids don't know that like well you're the smart ones and you're the not smart ones but kids are inherently smart and they know which category they're in and that becomes a part of their identity and they spend the rest of their lives thinking that they're smart or stupid because of how they were lumped in school when really they weren't necessarily more or less intelligent at all. They just were more or less, you know, suited for the very specific and particular educational structure that they were placed within. Um, I mean, I, I can keep going for a really, really long time. Like I'm barely scratching the surface <laughs> here, but there is there is so much and I'm going to stop talking at least for now so that you can redirect me or we can go down other rabbit holes. But there's... <sighs> There's so much here. There's mm -hmm. there's so much that's broken. It's very uh, annoying. I mean, it's it's essentially the the mass production of education. I mean, that's that's it's what the it mass is. production of good enough humans. Yeah, it's, it's really is what it is. It's like they're humans that are like good enough to get by. If we look at the initial vision for for for. And I'd like to do this, right? It's like, what, what, like, why did somebody create schooling in the first place? Well, there was a problem, right? The problem was is, is that we have all these kids, all these people growing up, 
And there's all these people that aren't educated. So what can we do about it, right? And if we create a system that ensures that, you know, all kids will have a you know baseline of education, right? And so this is the mass production of the basics, essentially. And it's it's like it's like with anything. When you mass produce something, uh yeah, yeah, like the the individual like if if you mega crops, right? You mass produce crops, you grow a ton of them all at once, you're looking at like an average crop. That's gonna be meh, you know, like the corn's okay. You know? <laughs> And then, and then you start spraying synthetic things all over it and, and, and terrible like pesticides and herbicides. And all of a sudden you've got crops that are like, yeah, we made them grow, but are they actually in a good place? Right. You know, mm -hmm. I know that's a, a very strange example oh, but, or it. comparison. No, it's actually very, it, it directly correlates. You have all these children <laughs> and you're like mass producing them and you're like, eh, they'll do. Like they'll make, like I'm, I'm being very, I'm, I'm speaking in generalizations, not about individuals to yeah. be very clear, but it's like, you know. We're going to raise a society of people who have like enough skills mm -hmm. that they'll make it in the workforce. But then we have all of these problems while we're mass producing them. Like some of them can't focus and we have this like, you know, pestilence of, of you know, little boy energy trying to bounce around the classroom. So we start giving them synthetic chemicals. We start medicating them and we start feeding mm. them like fake lunches in the cafeteria and mass so that we can like fertilize them or whatever. I'm trying to like tie this back so to good. your farming metaphor <laughs> um but like it's, it is the same thing it's it i actually think it is like a direct one-to-one -one comparison what you just said and what's happening in the schools mm -hmm. and it's it's so interesting because uh the purpose of mass produced crops right can you know these major large conventional farms oftentimes is to to create things that can feed into another process or system right so if we look at when when like what is school really good at and it's like well it's really good at creating nine to five workers right it's really good at creating people that want to enter into a career where they're told what to do they do what they're told they go home they make an average amount of money they don't complain they 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 you know they, they buy the food that they're told is good for you it's like that's that's what it is right and and what's happening is in my opinion is that the world is starting to change so aggressively because of of technology and and like opportunity and, and people are, we are currently, you know, recording on microphones and talking to create content for people to listen to so they can continue to educate themselves because there's, there's business here. There's, there's passion here. There's enjoyment here. And it's like, dude, people, 12 year olds can pick up a, a, an iPhone and create a YouTube channel and make money. Mm -hmm. Like they can do that today. And the, the opportunities in life have just shifted around and changed so much. The working opportunities, the working class, it's like, it's, it's different. And the schooling has not really followed suit. So we've almost got this, this situation where the, the needs on the, on the back end of what we need to do to be successful have kind of changed. It's, it's the same reason why, and, and we'll get here because I want, I want to talk about Montessori's soon. So we'll, I promise I'll, 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 I'll transition here. But like college, like the necessity of college, mm. there is a time in life, and and I I think the three of us here probably went through that time period wherein I think we were at the end of that time period. Yeah. But um, before us, and and up until about well when we were growing up, college was just like a mandatory thing you did if you wanted to be successful in life. It was like, well, you have to get an education so you can go to college so you can get a good job, and it was almost like and nowadays I look at that I think. Why? Mm -hmm. what, what, what is it that I need to go to college for? It's like, okay, well, if I want to learn something specific, college is a tool I can use, but there's actually other ways to do it now. But like, hey, I want to be a doctor. Okay, I need to go get educated so I can get certified, essentially, is, is what I'm going to school for. Mm -hmm. um, I can start a practice that's not, you know, a formal like doctor's office and help people with their health. Just I'm not certified, right? It's mm -hmm. like, that's essentially what college is becoming is like certifications that we're paying for. Mm -hmm. And anyways, I won't go down that rabbit hole too, too hard, but yeah, I think, I think this, this system, the schooling system is creating really good at creating people that, that are going into that, you know, system, that nine to five working, working week. Mm -hmm. So anyways, anything else on that, Hannah, but uh, after that, I would love to hear, I, I don't know a, a lot about Montessori systems and would love for you to break it down for me, the good, the bad, um, et cetera. But uh, yeah, anything else on, on the uh, conventional school systems? 
I mean, we could talk about it all day, but I think we're at an organic point to pivot. We can always come back if we have extra time and want to keep going down this rabbit hole. I will also say just very quickly that the college thing that you just brought up is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about because I was, you know, I was the kind of kid that you told, oh, why are you thinking about not going to college? You mm. you would do so well in college. You would open up so many more opportunities for yourself. You really should go. Like, are you are you sure you want to mess up your life like this by not going to college? Yeah, yeah. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about like, well, are they right? <laughs> am I am I destroying my life potential because I'm not going to college? And I decided to treat the four years that I would have been in school as a four-year experiment to see like, can I successfully launch some sort of career? I didn't even know what I wanted to do when I decided not to go to college. I had no clue. But I was like, can I, can I do something that's going to be indicative that I can make money and I can do work that I'm excited about? I can grow because I didn't really know what direction I wanted to grow. And I just knew I was you know, ambitious. I wanted to do something mm-hmm. that felt like I was always growing. And so I spent a lot of time over the course of those four years thinking about it. I decided very quickly that not going to college had been the right call and that I was not missing anything important. Like I I didn't look back. Within six months, I was just like, yep, this was correct. But I also spent a lot of time thinking through, okay, but if this is right, then why did everybody tell me I was wrong? Mm-hmm. And like, why did everybody tell me this wasn't going to work? And like, why is everybody so fixated on this college thing? And like, what is it actually a proxy for? And how can we replicate that? Like, how could I replicate that? And how can I help other people replicate that? Because that's very quickly became what I was doing in my work. But also like, how do we think about this in a bigger picture way? And so there's like, you know, a huge rabbit hole to go down with that too. But I just think it's like worth really acknowledging that that's a huge part of the conversation. And I think it's a very necessary part too, because so much of K-12 education is predicated on the idea that you're preparing children for college because mm-hmm. that's the pinnacle of their education experience. And really, it's not even the college part. Like, you know, to your point, the the certification is important. Like, you're, you're not really going for the education. You're going for the piece of paper that said that you got the education so that you're legally allowed to do this thing and or you can charge more. Um, but even then, like, people don't get into Harvard really for like the class they're going to take in their junior year on you know political politics and economics or like whatever that they find really interesting they're going to be able to say they got into harvard so Mm -hmm. really the entirety of someone's education is built around the junior and senior years of high school when you're preparing to apply to colleges and then like the acceptance and entering into of the institution like that's the make or break moment and so it's important to talk about the college stuff i think really from the beginning because we would do kindergarten differently mm-hmm. if we didn't care about whether or not a child was going to be college ready at age 17. Like I, I see advertisements for college prep kindergartens and preschools. I kid you not. And I'm just like, why are we subjecting children to this? So I think that's just like such, even if it's like not a rabbit hole that like needs to be gone down and like, you know, a, a, you know, we don't need to I like. I do want to talk about it. And I have a question about college <laughs> yeah. for you. And that's that. Um, Hannah, and I'm just kind of opening this up with a, with a question that I could potentially answer. But I'm more interested to hear what you would say. What is the benefit? And because you brought up even like the Harvard, right? So let's 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 use mm-hmm. Harvard. Uh, so I went to a small Christian college that now doesn't exist; it closed, right? So um, mm-hmm. I'm really just you know sad. in it. In, anyways, it's funny. But anyway, anyways, <laughs> uh, sad but kind of funny. The the um, school that I went to was like as small as it gets. What benefit? And I, and I want you to answer this like coming like into the defense of Harvard, right? So put yourself there if you can. Mm-hmm. So what what benefit, what is someone getting at Harvard that I'm not? What, what's the difference between the education that they're receiving that I'm not? If we took the same major. Yeah, I can I can totally steel man this for a second. I'm going to, I'm going to steel man it and then I'm going to straw man it. I love it. it. Um, we're going to, we're going to come at this from both sides. So the steel man argument for Harvard is one, you're buying prestige. Mm-hmm. So I can have a water bottle that I got on like the clearance rack at Aldi, or I could have this Yeti and I can walk into a room carrying either of those. They serve the same function. They both carry my water. They're going to keep me hydrated. I don't have to drink out of a plastic bottle, which is great. Um, Functionally, they serve the same purpose. But when I carry this Yeti, it has some level of signaling like, oh, she paid 
money mm-hmm. for that water bottle. She has the nice water bottle, which I, I didn't. I got an event for free, but it doesn't matter. Like the point is that people see this and like, oh, Hannah she expended yeti. resources <laughs> yeah. to have a Yeti in so the good. same way that if you wear Lululemon, it looks more prestigious than the pants you got at Old Navy. Or if you drive a BMW, it has prestige over, you mm-hmm. know, driving like a hand-me-down Hyundai or whatever. Like it signals something about your status and or your wealth and or your like you know social value um and or like just your capacity as a person like you were so good that like yeti just wanted you to carry around a water bottle because they like wanted people to think that people like you drink out of yetis or like whatever your opportunities Um, you're worth more I want to get to know that person because their connections might be something that's more beneficial to me. So at the end of the day, we're selling ourselves, we're selling ourselves to people in a way of like that person thinking, what can I get out of you? Right. Mm -hmm. And so if I've got a Yeti, maybe I've got something else that you could have. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's like this, this social signaling of like where you fall in the social hierarchy. Um, So that's a huge part of Mm -hmm. Harvard. And obviously like, you know, a, a Yeti is a nothing example, depending to, compared to having a, a Harvard degree. Totally. Like that's you know so much more important mm-hmm. than the social strata. But it's like it's the same phenomenon. Um, so that's part of it is just being able to say, you know, everybody has not everybody, but you know, lots and lots of people go to college, and like everybody who went to college has a degree and you know whatever, but only a very small number of them have a degree from Harvard. Mm-hmm. You're signaling somebody at Harvard, which is a prestigious place to be involved with in the first in the first place, thought Harvard was a club that I should be in. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, you know, the top institutions do attract the top talent. So you get to learn from, you know, you could you could learn about evolutionary biology from anybody or, you know, chemistry or physics or, you know, literature or medieval history or uh, Spanish literature, like whatever you're interested in from the person at your local university, or you could learn from the person who was able to compete their way into the top tier job at Harvard. And there is going to be a delta there in terms of like, it's, it's not universal across the board. It's mm-hmm. not like everybody at Harvard is always better than everybody everywhere else, but it's like, you know, you're, you're going to get to learn from some of the most prestigious scholars mm-hmm. in any field that you find interesting. Um, there's also the network effect, which is a very legitimate selling point mm-hmm. of a prestigious university. Like prestigious people go to prestigious universities and then they go on to do other prestigious things and you have the same alma mater and you get to talk to those people and say, hey, I'm like, you know, from Harvard and they're much more likely to listen to you. You can get introductions. Um, mm-hmm. The network is powerful. And that was probably one of the bigger things that it actually didn't give me pause when I was deciding not to go to school because I didn't realize the value of the network yet. Like I just, it wasn't a thing I was thinking about. I didn't think about it until much later when I started to replicate it myself outside of college. I was like, wait a second, you can also get this on Twitter, Mm -hmm. but like they sell this to you at universities for like 60 grand a year. But like, I can just tweet at people and I can also talk to them. Like, that's weird. Mm -hmm. Nobody told me that. And then I started like breaking down the cost benefit analysis of like, wow, the network's actually really useful to have. I didn't know this because I never had it. But is it really worth the cost of, you know, there are other ways of signaling that you're someone worth talking to besides going to Harvard. I can, you know, I could I could have taken the route where I went to the Harvard School of Education and then tried to talk to people at Harvard about education stuff. Or I could go build Rebel Educator and have 130,000 followers on Twitter and then reach out to somebody and go, hey, like you're at Harvard. I have this question. I want to interview you, whatever. And because I've built credibility in a different way they're also going to talk 100%. to me so there's lots of different ways of doing it's this a great point. but i think those are some of the like if you've gone to harvard it's going to be pretty easy to like get a job interview somewhere because people are going to take you seriously it's going to be easy to get in the door in different places and that is pretty significantly different from having a degree somewhere else so that's the steel man argument for it um i kind of got into the straw man argument already but like you can get the network for free on Twitter. You just have to tweet interesting things. You can tweet interesting things by reading interesting books and developing your own capacity as a thinker and like reading other interesting people and learning how they have dialogues and debates and then talking to them. Like you can replicate all of that without having to spend 60 grand a year to learn how to do it. Um, 
there are other ways of, you know, if, if college is a signal of your perceived value on the market, there are lots of other ways to signal your value. Um, there are also lots of different signals of value, right? So somebody, uh, I love, I love earbuds as an example of this, actually. So people walk around with their AirPods mm -hmm. and they're like, look, I have AirPods. They're expensive. It's Apple. It's a social, like it's a status symbol. It's like, I'm probably walking around, like listening to a intellectual podcast or having an important business conversation. And it's like, you know, you're, you're signaling something by walking around in your AirPods. But then there's another group of people who are walking around with their wired headphones going like, I don't like EMF radiations. And like, I know that that's like a thing that you get from your AirPods. And so I'm walking around with my wired headphones and I'm sending a different signal of my intellect and intelligence because I've read about radiation and I don't want to put that like next to my brain. So you have these like two separate groups of people who are walking around doing like signaling two very separate things. And to different types of people, like they're going to have very different reads on those two signals and they're going to perceive one as being very high value and the other one as being disinteresting. And then other people, that's going to be flipped. And so you can signal that you went to Harvard and the people at Harvard thought you were good enough to be at Harvard and clearly you must be very intelligent and like, you know, very well read and, you know, very competent and capable but then other people are going to see that and be like, well, you just sort of like are a conformist of, to the nth degree because you went to like the peak of all conformity and went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I'm much more interested in talking to people who found other like non-systemic ways of signaling their value by like maybe you wrote a really interesting paper on your own. Maybe you started a podcast and talked to really interesting people. Maybe you're building a startup. Maybe you're like innovating in some area that you find very interesting. So I think you can both replicate the perceived value of the Harvard degree in other ways. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can signal the same thing. And I, I love Twitter truly as an example for this, because if the whole point of Harvard is to get to talk to interesting people and have like sort of the social credibility of interesting people or like, you know, socially prestigious people sort of endorsing you by nature of being within their network, mm -hmm. If you just like spend a lot of time on Twitter and you become, you know, like you get followed by a few people who also are connected to Harvard, you're basically sending the same signal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you can do the whole thing on your own. You can bootstrap it. Um, but you can you can figure out like what is it that I want the world to know about me that's going to make me valuable on the job market mm -hmm. or valuable on the dating market or valuable on the social market or like whatever, you know, aspects of the world you want to play in and you think that having some perceived prestige is going to be valuable for you can go replicate all of those things and you can actually attract a different subset of people who are probably like if you're skeptical about the value of having a degree from an institution like harvard you probably can attract people who are also skeptical of that mm -hmm. and actually find more value in the signaling mechanisms that you've chosen mm -hmm. um and it's interesting like i talk to entrepreneurs who I mean, I mean, I talk to people across the whole spectrum. I also have friends who went to Harvard. Um, oh yeah, no hate like, if you know, you're out there listening and you went to Harvard. To be, it's just to a be great very example. clear, <laughs> like yeah, it's it's a great example yeah. of this because you're like you know you're you're going right to one of the like core cultural institutions for, you know the like signaling the pinnacle of of academic and intellectual prestige. So it's a really good one to like break down. But you know, I have friends who went to Harvard. Um, I have friends who've like taught at, you know, high, like, like Ivy league institutions. I also have friends who run businesses and will not touch with a 10 foot pole. Anybody who comes out of those institutions for mm -hmm. hiring or working with, because they see them as being so ingrained in the system mm -hmm. that they're going to be detrimental for the culture being built at the company. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be helpful or useful as employees because they're so <clears throat> entrenched in this systemic way of thinking. So it also can become a liability depending on where you're trying to go. So it's a, it's a complicated question. There is no one right or wrong I agree. answer. It's, it's highly, highly personalized. But I think the point, the fact that it is highly personalized gets really lost in the way that we talk about it. We just assume it is this like ultimate good, this universal good, no matter what. And like anybody should go to Harvard and it will be great for them no matter what. Like just get the Harvard degree and then you can go do whatever you want. For a lot of people, it might actually be a liability either financially or socially or intellectually or in terms of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Um, 
but it's like it's the act of dissecting these different things that's actually the important work and it's hard so it takes a lot of work to sift through but like that's actually how you land on okay what's what what do i want out of life and then what's actually the path that's going to be useful for me and then all the rest of the noise you can just shut out because it is noise and it doesn't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to ditto. I'm going to, I'm going to also answer it. Cause I was thinking about this beforehand. Love that. I agree with everything. I mean, so spot on and, and, and Hannah obviously thought about this a lot more than I have. That's why it was so much better than I could have done. So the, but the, 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 on, the only thing I would add that I have thought about, right. I'm like, okay, I went to Cincinnati Christian university and I got to play soccer there. It was awesome. Super rad. Glad I went to go play soccer and, Definitely my favorite part of college was the sports <laughs> and the friendships that I got to make there. Mm -hmm. But um, from like the, what would I have attained differently from an educational perspective? Or what, what could I walk away with that would be valuable to me? And I think that, and I could be wrong. And I just assume that to be successful in a college like Harvard or, you know, I don't know, Dartmouth or, you know what I mean? Like Cornell, all these colleges, right? I'm like, you probably gonna have to work your freaking butt off. But that's how I feel. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you don't. Maybe you can show up to Harvard. It's all you pay for it. But I get the sense that if you roll into Harvard, you have to absolutely be so unbelievably focused. You have to work so hard that the, like, like Hannah said, you're getting like the top talent professors and they're, they're expecting a lot. You're, you're at Harvard after all. Right? Yeah. And so I, I do believe it's possible that you are working your butt off and attaining some grit as a result of going to Harvard. And that's something that I feel like oftentimes that would be the one thing that I would, I would pull out of like the college experience that can happen that, that can sometimes be, be lost is it, like, like Hannah was saying with everything else, it can be easily attained without mm -hmm. college. So let's be very clear. Grit can be easily attained without college, same as influence and network and, you know, internal community. And I mean, it's just all those, it's just, you know, maybe you have to work at it a little bit more. Right. But uh, yeah, that, that was the one thing that I was thinking about. And I think um, I, I'm with your friends. There's something about, you know, the, the education in college started out as like a litmus test, right. Of man, we've got these major corporations, right. And we're trying to do major mass hiring. We, we need to hire 500 people in the next two months, right? And how are we going to filter through the 10,000 applicants? Well, we need to have some way of doing it. So how can we do that? Well, they, they needed to do something, right? So when Procter & Gamble are, are, are sitting down, the, the, the HR managers are sitting at their desks with all the resumes are coming across, they don't have time to read everything, but they know that, hey, man, if we, if we prioritize these different colleges, we know those people work really hard. Mm -hmm. We know they have education, and we know that uh, they've got to have somewhat of, of some responsibility if they've been able to get through college, right? There, there's like a basic litmus test. Well, that a lot of that's changing too, right? And so I think that there's there's definitely a, an argument to be made of um, I don't sit in the camp of my kids will get through school and go to college. I just don't sit there. And and it, but you know what? If they choose, they want to go to college. I'm going to, I'm going to actually sit them down and say, well, what do you want to go to college for? Well, I don't know yet. That's not a good enough for me. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I, not, not in this day and age. I'm like, okay, well, uh, college is a tool you can use to pursue something specific in my opinion. And me, I went to business school and I think I could be right where I am today without it very, mm -hmm. very easily. And, um, I, I, I ask, I ask a number of people, Lately, I'm like, last time you got hired for a job, did they ask to see your diploma? Or did you just tell them you graduated from a certain college? And they're all like, I don't even know what my diploma is. And I'm like, yeah, well, how do they even confirm you went to this college? I, mean, you could, I could totally just lie and be like, well, I, Hannah doesn't know I actually went to college. I could be lying right now. I, I, no one even knows. And, and at worst case scenario. Wait, can I see your diploma? It's like, <laughs> you know, I think I had. I don't even know if I still have it. It's probably Mine's right. over there, but Do you, I don't know where yours is. I anyhow, need to throw it away. Um, outstanding conversation, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. Hannah, Hannah wh wh where do you sit? Kind of, uh, I know we kind of had an interesting uh, uh, roundabout discussion around college, but tell me more about college. How do you feel about it? What's what's the future of college look like? Uh, that's such a good question. I want to I want to add really quickly on what you just said because you're talking about the grit component. Mm. 
And that like sometimes like that is a thing that people are looking at when they look at a degree. It's like, is this person gritty? Do they know how to work? Um, Obviously, there's wild difference between different types of schools and the level of grit required to get through them. The other thing that I really didn't emphasize that I probably should have is also like the intellectual development. Like that is a significant part of why people go to college and at a good school, it's going to be a significant benefit of having gone. And I think the important thing about all of these benefits is that like college doesn't have an exclusive monopoly on any of them. Mm -hmm. So you can get intellectual development without going to school. You can learn grit without going to school. You can signal your value mm -hmm. on the job market. You can build a network, like all of these things. Um, I just think that's like important to acknowledge because I didn't really talk about that very much. And that is like one of the primary benefits of college. So it deserves to like at least be named. In terms of, <clears throat> this is such a good question. In terms of the future of college, I think, like, I do think that we have this dramatically oversaturated market where, you know, so many people are going to college that it's not really a differentiator anymore mm. in the jobs market. Like, if everybody has a degree, what's the value? Mm -hmm. Like, it's a good point. It's not making you more qualified because everybody has one um so i do think there's some like it's really interesting so i graduated from high school in 2015 and when i decided not to go to college i like it's it's kind of wild like i would google how to be successful without college and almost nothing would come wow. up and they're like skipping college or whatever and the the primary things that did come up were from this startup apprenticeship program called Praxis that i was like well these people are amazing so i must go work for them and i did um i was like okay i'm not crazy there's like at least three other people in the world who write <laughs> blog posts about this and aren't going to think i'm insane um but over the course of like the 5 years after every major publication wrote pieces on skipping college and what to do instead of college and apprenticeship programs and, you know, internships and like all these different things that people were doing instead of going to college and, you know, major corporations started dropping their college degree requirements and their hiring process, which were kind of a scam to begin with because you absolutely could get the degree without, or sorry, get the job without a degree. But there was a sort of perceived barrier to entry and it was harder to convince people to hire you, but like that started to fall away. So I do think that we're, you know, in some ways, we're past the peak. We're past peak college degree mania, where like everybody thinks you absolutely have to have one or your whole life is going to be destroyed and you're going to live under a bridge and it's going to be terrible. Um, like it's more, there's a more nuance to that now, that conversation, I think. Um, but I also think there's still like so much infrastructure in our education system. It's just funneling people along to the college path and it's just sort of like drones on and it's not really like it's going to take a while for that to change um so i do think like you know there's also like interesting phenomena where there's like you look at the demographics of who's going to college like way more women are going to college than men which is like very interesting from like a social dynamic sustainability standpoint of like how does that work if all the women are super educated and the men aren't and like do women even want to go to college if there's no men there? Or are they going to think it's boring? Like what, you know, what it, it's, it's weird, the social dynamics that are occurring around this too. Um, so I think it's going to continue to change pretty dramatically. I think people who are building alternatives to college are going to continue to gain traction. Like there was a huge um, media push around Lambda school about six, seven years ago where they, you know, Austin Allred was building this coding boot camp that was you, you know, go through this online program, you learn how to code, you get a job at a software company, you pay for the program through your earnings at the software company, gained tons and tons of traction, a whole bunch of different coding boot camps started to spring up. Um, I think we're going to see more and more things like that starting to emerge. Like they're early indicators that people are ready, but I do think it's a trend that's going to continue. And I think, you know, we're seeing such a mass exodus of the education system at large across the board with the homeschooling numbers that are skyrocketing and 
private school attendance skyrocketing and you know all of these different types of innovative schooling models are starting to emerge i think that we're going to see like people deviating from the system in k-12 are probably going to have more questions about college as well so i do think there's going to be this you know sort of continuing trend of skepticism i don't exactly know like on what timeline mm -hmm. college attendance is going to shrink dramatically i don't think the colleges ever need to go away or anything like they're valuable to some people but i think i think it's an area that's really 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 ripe for innovation i think a lot of it, there's there's a lot to be taken advantage of there for people who want to build better models um i think that there's been a lot of sort of socially derived stagnation around it where it's just you know well i don't want my kids to look dumb so i'm going to make sure they go to college even though like you know across the board it might not be the most beneficial phenomenon kind of thing going on um i want to make sure my kids get good jobs and like it's kind of scary if they don't because they didn't go to college and we made the wrong choice around this but i do think i think some of that's starting to dissipate and I think like I have a hard time imagining that my generation's children are going to be like that we're going to be forcing our kids into the college path. Like I think I think my generation is a little too jaded about it to like continue the trend. So it's probably going to be a slower evolution. But I do think I do think change is happening. Here's my as as you're talking, I'm thinking through this scenario. And I think you answered it already. So I'm just going to verbally process out loud. And Hannah, I want your opinions. Mm -hmm. There might be some situations or communities where people feel like college, they don't have opportunity in their current community and college is their, their door out of their current system. Like you'll hear like, hey, I was the first person in my family to go to college. And that's like a huge accomplishment and amazing. Mm -hmm. And so for so initially, I'm like, OK, so what about for communities? What about people who fit in that, who feel like I don't have any opportunity in my current community? I need a college degree to be my escape out of this. But then I go back to what you said earlier about, hey, let's identify the value of college value of college is that you have access to networks you have increased intellectual stimulus you have hopefully some sort of guidance or mentorship from your professors you have a period of time where you're dedicated to one thing or a few things can you find those same values outside of school i love your analogy of like listen you can build community and network on twitter on the internet if you have a phone it completely changes the entire assumption that college is your way out of a lacking opportunity community. Do you know what I'm saying? So oh, yeah. like on one hand, I was like, oh, but college can be such a rich opportunity for people who, who feel that way. But then I was like, but wait a minute, Hannah just reminded me that there's so many other ways you can get there without going into debt of hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. So I think that's just mm -hmm. a really good reminder for people, if anyone's listening, that's like, hey, listen, college was my way out. I would never then go tell my kids to not pursue that. But we're in a different world. Even 20 years ago, it's a different world. It's completely different. So that was It's all. a very different world. And it's also... <sighs> like, if, if, if college was your way out, your kids probably don't also need a way out. Mm -hmm. Because you already got out, mm -hmm. like you got them to somewhere better. And I think like a lot of this, a lot of what I'm talking about, like honestly, the biggest bottleneck, like the technology is free. The resources are free. You can go on YouTube or Spotify or whatever, and you can find a million podcasts on any subject that you're interested in with all of the best subject matter experts. And you can go get, you know, a world-class education and whatever you're interested in. And you can listen to all the podcasts and you can go DM the person on Twitter or send them an email or whatever and ask them follow-up questions. And you can go watch their lectures on YouTube and like, you can learn about whatever you want. Um, there's, there's, there's no real constraint for the actual like rote information and there's no real constraint. The technology to access it and to utilize it is so cheap. Um, the real constraint is the creative thinking mm. to be able to see what's out there and to know what to do with it. And that is one of the functions that, <laughs> that college serves. 
is it gives people a structure to engage with information and that's that is valuable and i think you know if you're coming from a world where no one around you is doing this and you don't know how to replicate it because you don't know what you're replicating because you haven't seen it then college might be the best path mm-hmm. and that's great like go go do the thing mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and i also think i think that I think there's also like there's different cost benefit analyses to run on all of this too. So like if you get a scholarship, very different calculus Mm -hmm. for whether or not college makes sense. Totally. But at the same time, you're not just spending money. You're also spending your time. Mm -hmm. And what could you be spending your time on that's, you know, more or less valuable? So there's like different – there are different analyses of all of this to run. But I think, you know, I I think your point is correct. That I think think both your – like pushback and then also your like assessment of the pushback. Like I think both of those are true that if you are coming from somewhere where no one around you can serve as a role model for how to utilize the power at your fingertips, maybe college is the most efficient way to like just give you the paradigm shift that you need. Yeah. But also if you could find a role model and you can copy what they're doing to some extent or use them as like a jumping off point, then maybe you have the free tools that you need at your disposal and you don't have to go that route Mm, either. That's so good. I'm glad I asked you. Um, I want to get into Montessori stuff because I would love a definition of this and I would love to hear how it influences the way that we might interact with our children. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of Montessori. There There are a lot of different models that people that have been developed um, of, you know, different approaches to educating children that I am a fan of. Mm -hmm. Um, But Montessori is just an incredibly comprehensive philosophy. So the very, very simple version of this for those who are not familiar is that Maria Montessori um, was an Italian educator who developed an extraordinarily substantial philosophy around particularly early childhood development. Montessori schools are known for being like infants through about six-year-olds. Mm. So like roughly like infancy all the way through to what we would consider to be like kinder- the kindergarten year basically. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the the bulk of Maria Montessori's work focused on younger kids. Mm. She has, you know, writings that cover all, like, all the way through adolescence and like what we would consider to be the high school years. But the bulk of it's focused on younger kids. So most Montessori schools – are for it's like the preschool and kindergarten years basically um although there are some great montessori schools that like draw the philosophy all the way out through high school and they use the montessori approach all the way through but it's it is more than anything else a philosophy um there are lots of different practitioners of montessori education there are tons of different montessori schools there's not necessarily like an across the board quality or like standard level mm-hmm. across all of them. So you can see like wild variation between different types of Montessori schools or Montessori inspired schools. Um, not everyone's doing it well. The people who are doing it well are running really, really phenomenal education programs. Um, but Montessori was heavily, heavily, heavily focused on the stages of early childhood development. And everything that she built out and the way that she educates kids is structured around how the child is developing at very specific points in their in their process from infancy through to like the elementary mm-hmm. years, basically. Um, and everything about the education is intended to give the child as much agency as possible. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that you're raising an adult from the very beginning. And you want to raise an adult that is competent, that is confident, that likes to work and is good at working, is able to focus and is able to complete tasks and is able to do things that are beneficial both to them and to the world that they live in. There's a very heavy emphasis on like the value of work uh, and teaching that to kids very young. But also, you know, they want to raise humans that are thoughtful and that are good at thinking and that are you know good at following complex 
progressions of logic and ideas and like rationalizations and the complex stages that are required in learning new complex skills. Mm -hmm. And all of that begins very early in a child's development. So you'll see videos circulating on the internet of like two-year-olds um, making scrambled eggs or like two-year-olds cutting up an apple and like, you know, scooping out the peanut butter on the plate and like making, you know, a snack for themselves themselves and their like little brother or their friend or whatever. Um, and that's like a very Montessori hmm. thing. Kids are entrusted with responsibility at a very early age. Um, but, you know, those are sort of like the clickbaity, like, whoa, look at what this kid can do kind of content. Hey, we're guilty. But the philosophy runs much deeper. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love the way that Montessori thinks about just like, creating a classroom for a child because like when you if you walk into a Montessori school at least one that's done well and you walk into a classroom everything in that classroom is child size so the tables are child size the chairs are child size and depending on the age range of the children they're different sizes so like the toddlers have smaller things than like three the three to six year olds the three to six year olds have smaller things than the elementary age kids but the entire space is set up for the children. It's everything is their size. They can use all of it. They don't need adult help for any of it. And then all of the things in the space are either like they're developmentally appropriate, but they're also intended to be learning materials. So the toys are all things that are helping the kids internalize information about the world or skills that they need to do like both academic things, but also grown-up world stuff mm -hmm. so there are toys in a Montessori classroom that are you know structured around mathematics and there's like strings of beads that are like divided up into different like there's like sequences of different numbers where it's like by fours and by fives and by sevens and the kids can learn to count by different numerical increments they can there are toys that are like math puzzles that the kids can solve. There are toys that are intended to help kids solve, like develop the fine motor skills that they need to, to write things. There are toys that are, you know, they're letters that the kids can string out and they can like start to form words before they have the motor skills to write themselves, but they can use the letters to formulate words. So they're actually like, they're ready to make words, like spell them out faster than they're ready to write them out often. So it like separates these mm. two things so that the kids can be learning how to read and write faster than they maybe have the handwriting skills mm. to keep up with. Um, there are toys like different like toys that involve blocks and like geometric structures that are, like, they just look like fun, but really they're helping the kids internalize the the skills that they're going to need to like, do complex algebraic and geometric problems when they're in middle school and high school and they are because they've had this embodied experiment experience of playing with these toys they understand conceptually like oh when i'm like solving this equation these are how the shapes are moving around like this is what's mm -hmm. happening because they played with this thing when they were five mm. um so it's this very very child-centric agency focus like the child should be you know, they should be have the independence to be owning this experience as much as possible. Like the, the adult's job is just to observe and to help when they're asked or when the child's like misbehaving in some way based on the rules of the space. But they're not there to like teach a whole group lesson and they're not there to tell the kids what to do and they're not there to interrupt the child when the child is focused. Like the children are supposed to be, like if you're focused on something, like let them be, mm -hmm. let them do their thing. Um it's really heavily focused on the child's sense of like their own, not just responsibility, but like the pleasure that they take in completing their work. Um, and then, you know, the space is full of like, everything's made of natural materials. Like there's lots of wood, it's beautiful colors. The kids are responsible. Like each child in the classroom has their own chores to like maintain the classroom. They get fresh flowers every day and they like put them in vases on the tables. And when it's, lunchtime like it's you know their job to set their own tables and they do they do their own dishes there's like all of these mm -hmm. rituals that the children partake in to like learn how to not just navigate in their space but also build the meta skills of like having responsibility and having these habits and having this sort of respect for the space in the same way that their space is being respected by the adults around mm -hmm. them um 
and the idea is to raise children that are very self-directed, um, take a sense of pride and ownership in their work, are completely unafraid of, okay, I have a question or I want to learn how to do this thing and I'm going to go figure it out. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to solve it for me. Um, it's a really beautiful modality of education, but it's also really beneficial in raising, I think, the types of kids that a lot of people exit the public school system because they're they're hoping to raise these types of kids and they feel like the status quo system is not going to do it. And they're, they're definitely not misguided in that belief that the status quo system is not going to. But I think Montessori is a really great example of a philosophy that like, even if you have no interest in having your child in a Montessori school or any type of school at all, or you have no interest in, in delivering like a fully Montessori education to your kids, it's still something that I think a lot can be drawn from because it's just like such a sound and robust philosophy. Mm. So I'm thinking of ways – that was beautiful, by the way. I'm like, I want to go visit that classroom. I actually have a friend who teaches at a Montessori school, and the way she's explained it is very, very similar. She's like, everything is low. It's all kids' size so that they can do it themselves. And I'm like, okay. Um, but it's like it sounds like it'd be really easy to translate or to transfer a lot of those principles into your homeschool environment. And to me, the intersection mm -hmm. of that sort of giving kids agency and responsibility is and having them at home, having a home education is really beautiful. The part where I see home education being really hard and a stressor and the thing that everyone's like, ooh, I could never do that, is when you try to just replicate the institutionalized schooling in your home. Those two don't mix. Montessori sounds like it mixes. Sounds like a lot of honestly what we just naturally do as parents. Like we are the one that had like our two year old scrambling eggs. And, you know, right now we have a 12 year old who can make an entire dinner from scratch, including the chicken stock for the pot pie and like the pasta. Like she can, she's unreal because she's been given that responsibility for the last six years. Mm -hmm. I guess when she was six years old, she started cooking. So, like, and something that Joey and I have been talking a lot about is like, okay, our kids are not within these five day a week schools. They're not with their peers, but we have things that we want to be pushing them towards every single day. We're not taking like this lax approach just because we homeschool and we want to be cozy in our house and, you know, drink tea all it's day. very intentional. Like we're being very intentional. There, it's, it, I thought you were being sarcastic at first, but no, it is. It's very intentional. <laughs> And um, <laughs> although there's a lot of tea sipping, I'm going to be honest, it's it's a very cozy time. It's intentional. But <laughs> like there's ways that we're trying to push our kids because we found that the more we give them responsibility, the, the happier they freaking are. Like they're just so much happier. And that's something for me as a kid, I didn't really have a lot of responsibility. I, even before we hopped on, I like wrote a list of a quick list of chores that I want the girls to get done while we're recording right now so that when we're done with the show, we can go have dinner with my parents. And like, I don't want to come home to a messy house. So like children clean up the house while I'm recording. And, you know, I get an eye roll and I'm just like, the amount of chores that we ask you to do is really, really minimal. And Joey's like, I had to do, I had to bring in wood for the fire. And I'm like, all right, little house on the prairie, Joe. But for me, Dude. I had to walk uphill both ways I, to bring right, it like, from the wood pile. That makes sense. But like, for me, I didn't really have chores. I didn't have to keep a clean room. I had to sweep the steps. That's all I had. I didn't have to cook for myself. I mean, I had to like microwave stuff, but I didn't have to, I didn't have chores and responsibility given to me. And because of that and other reasons, I'm sure, and my parents were phenomenal, but like, I think I missed out on some earlier maturing because I didn't. I, that not much was asked of me, honestly. So I, I want to ask a lot appropriately of our kids. Joke as you will, but my kids worked me, or my kids, my parents worked me like a dog. I just did. And I, I can. Are you resentful of that or no? No. I mean, at the time, I didn't like it. But I mean, looking <laughs> back on it, I'm thankful. And it was, it was, uh, I mean, I, I would love to have like my brothers in the room right now. Cause they'd be dying laughing. Cause they'd be like, Oh my gosh, mom and dad were always so crazy with all the work and all the things. And, and, uh, I mean, it, it just got, it became very normal that like avoid mom and dad. Cause they're going to ask you to do something. Mm, yeah. 
I think feel like sometimes your dad just came up with random he, stories. He did sometimes because he does do that. that to me sometimes. He, he would, and if we, I'm we and, and my my brothers would be laughing about that too because sometimes it was more or less like I feel like he's bored or annoyed that we're bored, yeah. And so, so he's gonna make us like organize and clean the garage just because you know we look a little too happy. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, there was definitely something that. Yeah, I love that. Tell talk to me more about what this Montessori attitude looks like as the kids get older. Because I actually didn't know that a lot of her work was geared towards really, really young, young children. That's fascinating to me. So, like, how can we fully express this, or what are some of the values we can take into educating older kids? Let's say, like, middle school, high school. I think so. For younger kids, a big part of the philosophy is they're not just being like sat down and told. Mm. Like, this is how this thing works, and now you're supposed to go do it. There's there's a, a really act heavy element of discovery mm-hmm. built into the, the approach. So as kids get older, there's just, like, a heavier emphasis on that. Like, instead of just sitting t- kids down and telling them, this is how planetary movements work. Like, we're, we're studying astronomy this year. This is how the planets move across the sky. You're going to get a lecture on it. Maybe you'll write an essay, and then we're moving on. You treat the child as a discoverer of their own world that they're living in, and you encourage them to replicate the process that humanity at large has gone through in discovering these things. So you give them some tools and you say, okay, I want you to keep a log of the night sky. Like I want you to notice Mm. how these stars and planets move over time like go outside every night and look and like take notes and notice that like some of these planets are wondering they're moving and then this constellation that we see like up in the east is going to move towards the west as the season progresses and eventually it's going to disappear and all of a sudden a child discovers that there's this constellation called (coughs) excuse me this constellation called orion but you can only see it for half the year and then the other half the year it's gone and the kid's like well why is that like why can't I see Orion it's like well because it's summertime and you like go through this process of the child observes that the world around them is changing and they learn about planetary movements not from having somebody lecture them in a classroom but through hands-on experience Mm. and that hands-on experience component is really 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 important Mm. if you want to raise children that are thinkers and doers, they have to learn how to interact with the world by thinking and doing, not by being, not by, you know, sitting and listening mm-hmm. um, and just accepting what they're told and doing what they're told. So that's a really heavy emphasis, like point of emphasis inside of the Montessori classroom as children get older. Maria Montessori was her, her writings on uh, like older kids are really interesting she thought that kids should all like go to boarding school on a farm when they hit middle school and they should all like spend two years on a farm learning how to like uh they should like each each one of them has an area of responsibility on the farm and like they all learn together like how to keep this farm operational and how the farm functions as functions as like an economic entity in the broader economy and like the broader social ecosystem and the kids learn some independence by like living on the farm and being away from home and then like you send them home and they're kind of like ready to go interface with society now basically she thought like the farm was sort of like finishing school Mm. sort of that's like that's kind of a poor analogy but like that's like the last piece of the puzzle that you need basically this is you know a a gross um simplification of like a whole book yeah but (laughs) but like you know she was very very pro kids getting into like get their hands in the dirt in the real world literally speaking but also metaphorically speaking and like actually doing things and i think you know that's the spirit of that is a thing that you really can draw into working with older children like when they're curious about something how much of it can they discover for themselves How much of it can they, like if they're learning first in theory, how much of that theory can then be translated into the real world observation or action? Mm -hmm. And how much can they start to interface their learnings, not just with, you know, things that they're doing academically, but with the real world. So if your child is interested in a particular vocation or 
you know, in learning a particular skill, can they go apprentice with somebody? Can they intern with somebody? Can they go shadow if they want to be a hairdresser when they grow up, like go shadow a hairdresser for an afternoon a week and like start to learn how to like, what is that like? Do they like it? Can they start to pick up some skills? Can they start to see what their own life would be like and their their ways and patterns of working would be like if they were in that world too and that's what they were doing like how would they think about themselves in relation to that the more you can give kids that hands-on like allowing them to grapple with the world in the same way that if you give a toddler a toy that is geometric in nature and they're learning how to like disassemble it and reassemble it and it is an embodied set of actions that directly translate to the the removed theory of algebra and geometry that they're going to be learning years later but like the first step is the embodied like this is what it feels like to move shapes around mm -hmm. in the say and these, these are the this is the nature of the shape and these are the constraints of the shape like i can fit all the squares together if i put them in the box like side by side but if i try to put one at an angle like it's not going to fit like there are rules to how this works. You can like feel what it feels like. You can wrestle with it. You can figure out how to get all the shapes to fit when you're a very small child. In the same way, the more you can allow your older children to really like wrestle with the world around them and feel in an embodied sense what it feels like to be playing with these things long before they ever get to the abstracted theory. Mm -hmm. I think that's always really beneficial. It's like exposure therapy almost. Like, mm -hmm. how can we show them good examples of what adulthood can be? How can we show them? I think about that too. Like, one of the frustrations for me when people are like debating over whether public school or homeschooling is better, it's like it's so academic focused. And I'm just like, these first 18 years of a person's life is not just boiled down to the or their ability to read, write, and do math. Like, there's more to a person than their intelligence from an academic standpoint. So it's it, that always feels like a sticking point. And if we can just expose them to good examples of motherhood, marriage, fatherhood, professionalism, entrepreneurship, like hairdressing, farming, so much, you know, I just feel like that is such a simple way to view sort of coaching those older kids, those like 13, 14, 15 year old kids. And I feel like that's a lot, honestly, of what mm -hmm. your parents did for you, Joe. Yeah. So yeah. Any questions that you have? Man, this is, I'm, I am, no, this has been amazing. <laughs> I, it's just, I feel like we've talked about so much and, and I, I like going down the rabbit holes. It's been a really fun conversation for me so far, but what about you? Anything else? You know, I feel like the the realm of education and just our view of what an idyllic childhood should be is is such a personal thing. And like I was going to ask you, Hannah, as we wrap up, how would you encourage people who maybe do feel a conviction to step outside of the status quo, but they're scared? And as a graduate of the homeschool world, how would you encourage them? My parents didn't know anything when they decided to pull me out of the status quo system or just like bypass me from it completely. And there were way fewer resources out mm -hmm. there at their fingertips than exist today. And I seem to have turned out okay. Like I'm functioning in society. So like, I think I'm doing all right. Um, and so you can do it yeah. too. Um, but like there, there's, there's actually, there's a lot to say to this because it's, like if if you're scared, if you want to do it, but you're scared, you are so much less alone than you think you are. There are so many people who feel exactly the same way that you do. And if all of the people who were, who wanted to homeschool, but were afraid of being able to deliver a quality experience, all pull their kids out of the school system tomorrow, we would have dramatically different numbers in both public schools and in the homeschooling world. Um, and it's, you know, the system is designed to sustain itself. And part of what that means is that the system has to convince you that you need mm -hmm. it. So, of course, people who make a living educating your children are going to tell you that you're not qualified and you can't do this and you need them. But that doesn't mean that it's true. Mm -hmm. 
And it doesn't mean that you can't, like, you probably don't know everything right this minute that you need to homeschool your kids. You probably don't know half of it, but that's okay because you can figure it out. You can learn it. Like, you don't have to be an expert at algebra to say, okay, next year I'm going to teach my kids algebra. You can learn along with your kid or you can find resources that are going to teach your kid the thing. You don't have to know algebra to teach your kid algebra because you can help them find online courses and resources and worksheets and YouTube videos, like all the things that they need in order to learn it themselves. And you're not knowing is a feature of the whole process. It's not a bug because your kid getting to watch you say, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to figure it out is so incredibly, incredibly valuable to them because they get to watch somebody, an adult who they respect, say, I don't know, but I'm going to figure mm -hmm. it out, which is a life skill that your child is going to need to carry with them for the rest of their lives. And so you're not doing your child a disservice by saying, oh, I like, am I, am I going to deliver a subpar education if I pull them out of the system and I, you know, educate them in ways that I might not be qualified to, to educate them? No, you're not doing them a disservice because you're showing them a life skill that they're going to use for the rest of their lives. That's infinitely more important than any particular academic subject that you are teaching them. And there are so many resources out there. There are so many people walking the same path as you. There are so many people to lean on and to ask questions of and to talk to for moral support. There are huge communities on every social media platform you can imagine that are talking about this and will be happy to help you. There's so much support for this that you know the when when you haven't yet taken the leap the barriers that you're leaping over seem very high but the moment you take your feet off the ground and you're airborne you're like oh i had i had the power to do this all along um and most parents who are thinking about homeschooling their children absolutely mm -hmm. do yeah that's awesome ah oh, what an what an awesome conversation i feel like i feel a little bit built into as a homeschooling parent. I love the conversation we had around college too. I think I have some new perspective and just even how I'm going to be talking to my kids about college because they always ask me like, should I go? What do I want to go? And I'm like, you know what? I think your whole point of like, there are values there that you can find there and you can find them in other ways, but focus on, on what you need. So um, Hannah, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Yes, um, I can do that. So if you're on Twitter, you can find me at Hannah Frankman. All of my other projects are linked from there. Twitter is sort of, I really like Twitter. So it's kind of like my central hub for mm -hmm. everything, but also everything kind of links to everything. So you can enter the ecosystem anywhere. Um, if you're on Instagram, my handle is at Hannah Frankman podcast. And there are a bunch of clips from the shows that I've done, which is how I found, well, how you guys found mm -hmm. me, how, how we connected, which is then... I, I was so excited when I got your message like, oh, this is working. Yes. <laughs> um, um, and then I also have a podcast where I talk about all these things and I interview people in the education world who are doing everything from homeschooling their kids to working as developmental psychologists to doing like building schools and school networks to like funding like working as VCs, funding college dropouts, building companies, mm -hmm. like there's all different wow. types of conversations. So if you're interested in the homeschooling stuff, um, I'd recommend starting. There's a, it was actually my very first interview I ever did on the show. It's with my friend Connor Boyack. And we go deep, deep down the rabbit hole of homeschooling and like how to think about it and why parents are qualified, mm -hmm. even if they think that they're not. So if that last thing that we talked about resonates, that's maybe where I'd recommend starting. Yeah. Um, but Twitter and Instagram are the best places to find just like a repository of my work and what I'm up awesome. to. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being here, Hannah. I love this episode. I hope it's encouraging to everyone that is listening to it. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think we will be talking again soon. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Thank you, Hannah.